Well, we are continuing on in this series called I Am. I Am. Uh, We started this series last week by taking a look at where all of this I Am stuff started. Uh, In Exodus chapters 2 and 3, here's your like really quick recap. Moses leaves Egypt. He's in the kind of the wilderness taking care of his uh, father-in-law's sheep when all of a sudden he stumbles across a bush that was burning and was not being consumed. And then what made it even weirder was that this bush that was burning but was not being consumed started speaking. And that's just not normal, right? This is a very interesting thing. And so uh, they kind of engage in this conversation back and forth. And then eventually Moses just asks the question. He says, who, who are you? And then God speaks from the bush and he says this, I am who I am. It's an amazing statement. He says, Moses, I'm, I'm calling you to lead my people out of captivity. And when you go, tell them that I am has sent you. Now that's just amazing, isn't it? Like, when we say I am, we have to put a third word on, right? We got to like, I am this. God just says, no, 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 I just am. I, I am. I, I, I didn't have a beginning. I am. I, I don't have an ending. I am. I, I don't have any limitations, right? I didn't come from anywhere. I just am. Like, Parker, you got to hear this. Whatever you're in need of right now, God just says, I am. I am the answer to whatever you need. He is the I am that I am. And then hundreds of years after that moment with the burning bush, Jesus arrives on the scene and he says in John chapter 8, he makes this statement. He says, before Abraham was, I am. I love it. He takes the personal self-description of God given to Moses in the burning bush, and he says, yeah, let's make no mistake. I'm him. I'm the God who is speaking in the burning bush. It's this amazing moment. He says, I am. And what's amazing about the Gospel of John is that in the Gospel of John, you you see kind of this really interesting connection uh, to the Moses story, but but there's actually seven other times in the Gospel of John where it records the, these I am statements of Jesus. And so what we're doing in this kind of journey together is we're just kind of taking every week out to, uh, for the next little bit to look at these I am statements in the hope that we would learn uh, more about who God is and what this actually means for us. So if you're taking notes today, we're going to kind of take the next I am statement, and it's this. Jesus is going to say, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I don't know about you, but I love bread. A couple of years ago, there was a commercial with Oprah Winfrey, and all I remember was her saying, I love bread. I feel like I'm like Oprah for a moment. Like, I do. I love bread. In fact, one of the main ways that I judge a good restaurant is by the bread that comes before the meal. Like, like if you can get just a a fresh, warm bread, oh, it's just a little bit of, of heaven, right? But if the bread comes cold, stale, hard, if if it's too dense, like I'm very particular with my bread. Like, it's just not for me. Right now, right now, and and I should get like, I hope someone's listening, but Spago's, best bread. I'm just calling it what it is. It's always fresh, and they have these little garlic cloves that are cooked, and you could like spread it on the bread like butter. (laughs) Bread. It's good. It's good. And you know, what's interesting about bread is also, it's just one of those things that uh, almost all people groups in the world have in common. Like we make it in different ways, but, but it's just like all around the world, we eat bread. Well, this morning, Jesus is going to make the claim, uh, not that he's just bread. The claim that he's going to make is that he is the bread of of life. The claim is this, that he is the better bread. He is the best bread (laughs) that we will ever have. Why don't you turn with me in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 6. 
John chapter 6. As you're turning there, what I want to do is I want to kind of set up the context because we have to understand uh, why Jesus ended up making this statement that he is the bread of life. Well, earlier in John 6, okay, so we're not going to read this today, but what happens before the story that we're going to read, uh, Jesus pulls off one of his most famous miracles, and that was the feeding of the 5,000. Now, most scholars agree that the group wasn't actually 5,000. This number probably only included a count of the men. So if you throw women and children into that, this could be anywhere 10, 15, possibly 20,000 people. It's like a small town. And what Jesus does is he takes a little boy's snack pack lunch. He got a little bit of fish, a little bit of bread. He blesses it, and it multiplies over and over and over again, so much so that every single person had like a fish sandwich. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, it was... It was spectacular, and John's gospel says that right after he performed this miracle, it says that the people who received it, that they started realizing how they could leverage Jesus' power to their advantage. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to force him to be king, not ask him. They wanted to force him to be king. Well, Jesus, knowing the thoughts and intentions of their hearts, he leaves. He goes, spends some alone time with the Father, then he crosses the Sea of Galilee with the disciples. While on the Sea of Galilee, he walks on water, calms a storm, you know, just like Jesus does. <laughs> and then they, uh, they arrive at the other side of the lake. This is where we pick up the story. Verse 24 of chapter 6. It says, Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, They got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. So to be clear, this is the crowd that just received the miracle of the feeding of the 5, 10, 15, 20,000, okay? So it says they're now in search for him. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. (laughs) Okay, I love this, so good. Jesus here turns to the crowd and he says, like, okay, let's not play any games. I know why you're here. And he says, you're, you're not here because of who I am. You're, you're not here because you think that I'm the savior of the world. You're here because you had a fish sandwich yesterday, you liked it, and now you want seconds. And right here, what Jesus does is he starts to reveal the motive of their heart, and it's this, that they want the things of God, but not God himself. So he says, don't work for food that spoils. Now, when Jesus is saying this, ultimately what he's communicating is this. Like, don't, don't waste your life. Don't spend yourself in exhaust using all your resources and time and energy on stuff that, like, like bread, stuff that has a shelf life. Stuff that, that, that can't really meet the, the inner needs of your body. He says, don't, don't give yourself over and exhaust to these things that, that can temporarily numb you, but can never satisfy the cravings of your soul. And it's in this moment that, again, he exposes not just the motive of their hearts, but oftentimes the motive of ours. Like, like, how many times have we had this thought that, like, I'll, I'll really be happy and I'll finally be fulfilled if I just get this or this or this. And once I get that or once I achieve this, then I'll finally be filled. The people want bread. You say, okay, well, what's wrong with asking for bread? Nothing. There is actually nothing wrong in what they're asking for. What's wrong is what they're not asking for. They want the gifts, but not the giver. They want what God can provide, but not the provider. They they want bread, 
but not the baker. <laughs> and so God speaks, says, don't live for this. Can, can I just be uh, just transparent this morning? Um, I don't live in this moment by any means, but every now and then I'll feel like an ache inside of my chest. It's like there's this hollowness. And, and, and it's this craving inside. And then often when, when that feeling comes up in me periodically, there's also a thought that comes along with it that if I just achieve the next level, whatever that is, then that ache will finally go away. I remember being in Bible college and uh, feeling that ache inside and, and having the thought, well, the problem is that I'm not pastoring. So once I graduate Bible college and become a real pastor, then the ache will go away. So I graduated Bible college, became a pastor, and although it numbed me for a moment, it didn't fill me. Later in life, I would fall in love with a beautiful woman inside and out, Natalie Sykes. Yeah. We were engaged to be married. And all of a sudden, I felt that ache again. And the thought went through my head, well, okay, maybe what's missing here is marriage. Maybe marriage will fill that, right? Jerry Maguire, the movie, right? Like, you complete me. <laughs> you know, but interestingly, I married my wife. And although, like, it's great, I love my wife, but, but she didn't fill that ache. L later, we had kids, and I love my kids so much. And the thought's like, oh, maybe that's what's missing, right? It's just little kids running around. And once we have kids, then that's going to fill it. And, and so we have kids, and I love my kids so much, but they don't fill the ache. Eventually, I became the lead pastor of Parkwood Gospel Church. And look, we got all these people. But you know what? No matter how many people we pack into this room, you can never fill the ache inside. Why? Because you weren't meant to. Because my wife wasn't meant to. Because my kids weren't meant to. Because my job wasn't meant to. Because my house or my cars or my things, they weren't meant to. Right, But we're just kind of on this constant pursuit of just trying to fill ourselves with things. And, there's, and every now and then, like if we can just be honest, man, like we all know what I'm talking about. We all have that moment where it's, it's like, ah, oh, there's this emptiness. And it's like, okay, well, what do we do? So we just start chasing after something, anything that will try to fill that inside of us. And at best... At best, what it does is it numbs us for a moment, but it can never satisfy the true longings and desires of our heart. So Jesus just says, man, don't labor for food that spoils. Like, can, can I just ask, what's your bread this morning? What's your, what's your fish sandwich? What's that thing that right now you're desiring from Jesus and you believe that if he gave that to you, then you would be finally happy and fulfilled? What's your bread? Jesus says, don't labor. Don't spend yourself in exhaust over stuff that cannot satisfy the longings of your soul. He says, he says, labor for the eternal. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let, let's keep reading. Go back with me into the text. We're going to go to verse 30. So Jesus, again, go back into the story. Jesus engaged with these people who've tracked him down on the other side of the lake. And it says this. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? You ever just, be, just be, let me just hit the pause button. Time out. What a ridiculous question. Think about it. These are the people that just ate the miraculous fish and loaves. Moments later, Jesus, what are you going to do? You know, every now and then it's, it's interesting. 
I'll, I'll hear people say, well, you know what? If only God would show himself to me like he did to the people in the Bible, then I would believe. Can I tell you? Probably not. Honestly, you know what happens a lot in the Bible? Is God reveals himself in just moments later. What are you going to do, Jesus? Miracles are great, and they point to God's glory, but even a miracle in and of itself doesn't satisfy for the long haul. It doesn't fill for the long haul. It leaves us craving more. They come to Jesus. Jesus, what are you going to do? And watch this. I love verse 31. It says, Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. All right, so you got to see this. The people start engaging Jesus around a story that happened long ago in the wilderness. So when the, when the Israelites were led out of Egypt, and one of the miracles that God performed was he provided them with a bread that was called manna that arrived every single morning. And the imagery is that it came from heaven. It was a beautiful picture. And so the people say, well, Moses made it rain bread. What are you going to do? <laughs> so I love Jesus. He just, he's like, okay, let me just set the record straight. First of all, Moses didn't make it rain anything. Okay, God did. And then he says, all that stuff with, with Moses in the manna, all of that was a physical picture of a spiritual reality that is playing itself out in front of you right now. There is a true, better bread from heaven that has the ability not just to feed the Hebrews in the wilderness, but to satisfy and feed the entire world. It's a beautiful picture. So watch this, verse 34. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Because that is the right answer. I love this, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the thing that you've been searching for your entire life. I am the only one who can satisfy not just your bellies, but your soul. He says, I am the bread of life. And as he says this, he's basically saying, I am an endless supply of everything you will ever need. You know what's interesting, and I just want to be very clear on this. Uh, the invitation here that Jesus is making is not, hey, come to me once. Worship me once. Pray to me once. And if you just come, uh, I'm gonna, you'll, you'll, you'll never hunger again. That's not the picture. The picture here is this, that basically Jesus is saying, I, I am a 24-7 buffet of the best nutritious, <laughs> delicious <laughs> food you will ever taste. The invitation is not come once. The invitation is I'm here always for whatever you need. Years ago, um, we were sending missions teams to India. And uh, we did five years. I went on the first three. But the, the, the very first trip uh, that we went on, uh, we had a hookup from uh, somebody in the church where we could get flights on Emirates Airlines for the same price of what other people would be paying for like Air India. Now, now em Emirates is just a really nice airline. So we had this hookup. So we're like, all right, <laughs> I'll fly on Emirates. That's great. So we, we took our team. We're, we're flying out of Pearson International Airport in Toronto. And we showed up at the gate. We're the first people at the gate. And they told us, sir, we overbooked your flight. Uh, so they said, what we actually want to do is we want to upgrade your entire team to the first class, kind of business class section of the plane because it's easier for us to sell the economy seats. Now, several of you probably in the room sacrificed dearly financially for us to go. So I knew that. So I'm telling the team, hey, we're getting this upgrade. Nobody post any pictures. Okay. <laughs> 
We're going to the streets of India to help impoverished children. Nobody's posting first class photos on Emirates Airlines, but we got this upgrade. And so uh, what we didn't realize was this was like a double-decker plane. I've, I've never been on one before. And, and so we were upgraded to the upper echelon, quite literally. Like, like, like we were up in, in, in the amazing, spacious, first-class, business-class section while all the peasants were on the bottom <laughs> level in economy. <laughs> And what was, it, was, it was wild. Like, I've never experienced anything like it. Like, you don't just get a seat. You, you had your own cubby um, where you had, like, a bed that just, like, reclined when you wanted it. Multiple screens. There was a lounge that you could just go hang out in. Like, it was over the top. And then the flight attendants come by, and they, they drop us off a menu. And it's a really good menu. And then they said, listen, we'll be here for the entire flight. You want anything off of this menu at any time, you tell us and we'll get it for you. I've never experienced that before. Because I fly economy. Now, how many people here have ever flown economy? Okay, yeah. You know how economy works? You eat when they tell you to eat. Okay? And you hope that you're at the front of the plane because if you're at the back of the plane, well, the good stuff sold out. So you're, you get like the vegetarian option. <laughs> Sorry to the vegetarians in the room. <laughs> that was mildly offensive. Um, I know economy life, right? But this, when you're in the upper deck, when you're in the first class of Emirates, the, the business class area, when you have like your own bed to lay in, in a lounge to hang out in, in a personal flight attendant that will bring you whatever you want, whenever you, like, like honestly, you want to know what our problem is, Parkwood? Let me connect the dots for you. Our problem is that we have a hard time understanding or we forget who Jesus is and what he's really offering. The invitation to Jesus is not to come to economy. When you get to eat, when you're told to eat, and hopefully it's good, you never really know. No, no, no. The invitation to Jesus is first class. The invitation to Jesus is you come and you eat whenever you want. Like he is in endless supply. The invitation to Jesus, you got to like see this in the imagery of the food. It's, it's man, you can come for breakfast and Second breakfast and brunch and lunch. And if you want a second lunch, that's fine. You can have dinner, pre-dinner, second dinner. And if you're still hungry, you can have a midnight snack. Okay? This is what Jesus is saying. I am the bread of life. And whoever would just come to me, whoever would begin to eat from me, would you realize that, that he is this perfect endless supply. Parkwood, you have to understand that our deepest craving is not for something, but for someone. Our deepest craving is not for the gifts, but for the giver. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. You want to know what that means? Well, that that one thing, that eternity has been placed inside of you, that is the sole reason why you will never be satisfied with just buying the stuff of this world or achieving comfort or getting to that next level in your employment. You will never be satisfied in that alone because, because God didn't create you for that. He, he designed us and he created us in such a way that we will only ever be truly satisfied when we eat from him. So this is what he says. He says, I'm, I'm bread. He says, I know you're hungry. And he says, let me tell you, because these, these people on that day, he says, you don't even know what you're hungry for. He says, I... I'm the bread that you really need. I'm the bread that's not just going to fill your stomach for a moment. 
I'm an endless supply that can satisfy that deep craving of your soul. Uh, worship team, come on back up. Um, that day with Jesus and the crowds following him, after he made this amazing claim that he is the bread of life, he goes on to say even wilder things. <laughs> He looks at them that day and he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink my blood, you will never understand what real life is like. He says, you have to be consumed in me. And the people are just like, that's weird. I think he might be talking about cannibalism. Like, it's, it's like what's going on here? In fact, they, they say, this is too hard. And they walk away from Jesus, the only one who could satisfy them. So Jesus, he turns to his disciples, the 12. They're the only ones left. And he asked them a question. He said, are you, are you going to leave me too? Peter, right? It's always Peter. <laughs> Peter perks up, and I'm sure that in this moment, he is just as confused as those people were about the whole drinking the blood thing and you know, hopefully, Jesus, you can explain that one a little bit later. But he says this. He says, Jesus, where else are we going to go? He says, you alone hold the keys to eternity. Jesus, where else are we going to go? I remember it was 15 years ago when my dad died. I was in a conversation shortly after his death and emotions were raw. And I made some sort of statement about Jesus. And somebody said to me, really, Danny? After everything that just happened right now, you're still gonna hold on to Jesus. He's the one who could have saved him. He's the one who could have fixed this situation and he didn't. And really, you're still going to hold on. And I just had this moment of clarity, and I remember responding and just saying, who else am I going to hold on to? Like, yeah, I don't understand why this happened. I can't connect all the dots right now and make sense of everything, but, but he's still God. He's still God. You see, Honestly, I think sometimes what we struggle with is we want everything to make sense up here in our minds before we're ready to give Jesus our hearts. We, we want everything, like just intellectually, we just want to have it all make sense. And then if we can just make sense of all of it, then we'll give God our heart. Now listen, I'm not anti-intellectualism at all. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto the Lord. There's Many good reasons intellectually why we believe that Jesus is who he said he was. But if we can just be honest, sometimes we're in a situation when it doesn't make sense. Sometimes we find ourselves going through something and we can't connect the dots and we hold on, not because it makes sense, but we hold on because he's still God. And we know that his bread is better than the bread of the world. Peter says, where else are we going to go? You alone hold the keys to eternity. And we will stay with you as long as we can. <laughs> can we stand up? across this room. The offer this morning is simple but profound. The offer, Jesus is saying, would you just come and eat? He said, I'm bread. I'm the better bread. I'm the best bread that you will ever have. I'm the type of bread that if you eat from, you will never hunger again. So keep coming back. 
keep coming back. I am in endless supply of everything you will ever need. Don't put your hope in people. Don't put your hope in jobs. Don't put your hope in vacations. Don't put your hope in anything. Put your hope in Christ. And in Christ alone, he is the only one who can fulfill you. All this other stuff, it's not bad. There's nothing bad with taking a vacation. There's nothing bad with getting a job. There's nothing bad with getting married or having kids at all. These are gifts from God. But any good thing, if we make that an ultimate thing, we've just created an idol. So Jesus says, just come to me. Just come to me and eat. And so church, I just want to encourage us all around this room before we go. I want to encourage us as we sing this song, even in this moment right now, that we would go after the provider, not just what he provides. That we would go after the giver, not just the gifts. That we wouldn't just be chasing after what God can give us, but we would actually run to God himself. He is the endless supply. He is the true blessing that we need. So as we sing this, I just want to encourage you, let's take a moment right now, no matter what you've walked in with. Listen, if right now you are living in that moment where you feel that ache inside, I am telling you, nothing in the world can satisfy you like Jesus can, nothing. Other things can numb you temporarily. Jesus can satisfy. So church, come this morning to the table of God and let's eat from the bread of life.